There you Perfect. go. Okay. Welcome. I'm Sam uh, Curran, and uh, and we're uh, and doing an Ask Me Anything today. Um, two sites to be aware of uh, as it relates to Didcom. Of course, uh, I will field questions about anything, um, but uh, but there's uh, since Didcom is near and dear to my heart. Here is the the spec. Didcom.org is the beginnings of a of a community resource um, to. Uh, to be able to collaborate on protocols and other sorts of information, there is the beginnings of a um, of a of a book, uh, uh, a Didcom book, and I don't know where the link is here, um, but it's very rough at this point. But that's being built out with um, with information that's not of a spec nature, but more of a of an informative nature uh, uh, stuff there. So the, anyway, those are two resources to be aware of. Um, as we, uh, if you are, weren't already, um, and I know some of you are, of course. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I um, personally, I uh, I live in Idaho, um, uh, just over the the border from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, up in the mountains. Um, so it's there's snow outside, um, and it. Um, I one of the reasons we live here is our family loves outdoorsy things, and so there's uh, river rafting and the Snake River just over the hill. There's um, there's mountain biking and and backpacking and and all the things um, and so uh, winter sports are also a thing here. They groom Nordic trails and there's fat biking to do um, and so there's there's lots to be involved in. Anyway, that's a little bit about me um, and I'm happy to answer questions on pretty much anything um, and so that would be uh, that would be awesome. Um, Michael, you dropped one into um, uh, so two questions already. Awesome. Um, so Michael said, following up on the topic of DIDCOM adoption, what sorts of metrics do you feel are important? Uh, who should be targeted in, in terms of driving adoption? What things need to be done to help this audience? Um, so Michael, that's a good collection of questions. Um, and see, I see your question as well. Um, I, um, metrics for adoption is a really good one. Um, I have to sort of call out a, a sort of a, an obvious thing in order to talk about what we mean by adoption. DIDCOM itself is a protocol for secure communication built on DIDs. That's it. It has a very minimal number of protocols uh, that are uh, um, that exist to facilitate basic communication. One of them, for example, is a Discover Features protocol, which lets you figure out which protocols the other folks, you know, the other the other end of the contact supports, etc. Um, but other than that, it doesn't actually do anything. Now. Um, uh, it's, it's more of a platform. Think of it more like REST instead of all the APIs that are built on top of REST would be a, a reasonable analogy. The um, uh, one obvious use case of DIDCOM is doing things like moving credentials around with verifiable credentials. That's a really common use case. And so, um, and so uh, the, the question could be answered, each of these could be answered in two different areas. One is the success of DIDCOM generally. And the other one is the success of DIDCOM in the scope of things like identity agents and verifiable credentials and everything else. Um, and so I'll, I'll sort of I'll sort of attempt both of those. Um, Didcom generally um, has a lot of advantages um, because it's built on top of the of the Did uh, spec. Um, and so there's a lot of things that you sort of get batteries included with Didcom. Um, developing a protocol on top of Didcom is not substantially harder than developing, let's say, a REST API. But you get a handful of really convenient things for free, um, like. Uh, uh, like authenticated um, encryption, which allows you to be be confident of the of the key possession of the other party um, with every message that's that's sent, which is really convenient, and so um, uh, it's really useful there. So uh, in, for Didcom, generally speaking, I think that there is a lot of um, uh, a lot of evangelism that can get done as we talk to the sort of the wider uh, technology community and open source communities, and I'm, and I'm hoping that some of that happens this next year um, to help them explain what it is and what you can do with it. Um, and, and, and all of that work, to clarify, will be focused on DIDCOM v2, uh, not the DIDCOM v1. Um, uh, the, it's the historical beginnings of that. So. But what it is, why it's useful, why you should use this, uh, how it's helpful to, to build on this, and I think that that's a, a really useful thing. Um, this is kind of something that I wish it existed on the internet like 20 years ago. Um, and so I don't have a time machine, and so the best thing we could do is make it happen now. Um, and so I'm hoping that folks realize that the, the power that it has in the, in the um, and stuff like that. So, so metrics uh, would be, um, you know, how many independent um, 
both uh, both software packages and uh, and deployments of the software packages are actually uh, support did come um, would be one metric that uh, that could help that um, and uh, and and the other uh, another thing could be um, sort of general metrics like um, questions as Stack Overflow tagged with, with something like Didcom or you know other types of search history things could help sort of with the general awareness of of what's going on. Um, the um, uh, and so uh, for adoption, there's a lot of folks that don't really know that it's a thing that I think could benefit from it. Again, uh, someone mentioned this to me earlier that uh, that identity is something that most of us land in because we were trying to solve some other problem and then had to like make that happen. And so um, and so I think that um, as we talk to folks that aren't really identity people and just want to use available technologies, then I think that's the target for that. When it comes to verifiable credentials, we have, you know, uh, active um, organizations in the ecosystem, um, everything from, of course, DIFF um, to the Open Wallet Foundation is a new entry, W3C, etc. And so sort of feeling out and, and watching the adoption of DIDCOM um, in those packages. Um, so, for example, Verimo would be one or, or you know, uh, uh, the Aries community uh, adopting Didcom v2 um, would be really powerful there as well. So um, I think that that could uh, that's also powerful. And for that audience, I think we honestly just need sort of um, increased development of libraries and, and evangelizing the concepts, showing people what it's like and how uh, how easy it is and the benefits that you get from it. I think there's still a perception that Didcom is hard, um, and and uh, and so uh, I think I know a few of the reasons why there's that perception, and and uh, and I plan to do things to help that perception um, to, to help folks sort of figure it out. So yeah. Okay. So C asked, um, how would you explain Didcom to your mother? Uh, I love this because occasionally I, my mother is interested in what I'm doing. And so I can, it's, it's not an unreasonable question. Um, uh, so um, to be quite personal about my mother, um, she is not a technology person, but she likes to be engaged and do things. And so back when the internet was new, uh, she was, of course, naturally nervous about putting her credit card into a website, uh, you know, uh, so that it would get sent over the Internet. And um, and I explained her about encryption. Of course, that was state of the art at the time, you know, between a browser and a web server and showed her the little lock icon that exists in a browser that can tell you things about the encryption. Um, and if that lock icon is there is not there or is broken or some other symbol, then there might be a problem. And um, and once she knew that, she began to be comfortable um, interacting online. Um, she was a, she's been a Land's End catalog shopper a lot, and so she was thrilled that she hated it to pick what she wanted out of the catalog, call Land's End on the phone, and then not have it available. Um, because like the, it was out in her size or whatever, right? Um, and so she, was, she loved the idea that she could find out if things were in stock or not without having to call someone on the phone. And then as she became more confident, she would actually place an order uh, over the internet and everything else. And so that's the context of my mother. So I would explain to, to, to my mother in particular um, that um, Didcom is like that. It's like the encryption that allows us to pass things securely between browsers and websites, except that it works in a way that is more peer to peer in the sense that in addition to securing things between, uh, let's say me and some company that I'm interacting with, it can do that, but it can also uh, help with secure communication between uh, individuals and even enable secure communication between me and organizations or companies or governments or uh, you know other entities um, in a way that we don't really have today. For example, I could get a message from the DMV uh, with something about my driver's license, but I knew it came from the DMV as opposed to email today where um, where spam's a thing and, and authenticating email is a really hard problem. Um, and, and, and so Didcom can help with, with uh, communication and the engagement and protocols um, in a way that is secure um, and in private uh, and also gives us the trust that we need to engage the way that I believe that we want to on the internet. And we're doing mostly kind of, except that we do so with relatively high risk because of the various types of, of technology that we have or don't have um, as, the, as the internet has developed. And so, um, so that's that's pretty cool. So, see, I hope hopefully that helps. Is that this is a secure way of of communicating between um, uh, between uh, people and organizations on the internet um, in a way that is that is more peer to peer than it is uh, than things like APIs, which are fundamentally client server. Um, I probably wouldn't say the client server thing to my mother. She'd you know raise an eyebrow and I'd explain that too. But cool. Uh, Rob asks, what is Didcom's relationship history with Aries? Um, uh, build a protocol link on didcom.org goes to uh, Aries RFC 3 protocols on GitHub. 
So that's a good question. Um, DIDCOM was created uh, within the Aries ecosystem. Um, and so we didn't call it DIDCOM V1 then, we just called it DIDCOM. But, uh, but as interest grew around using DIDCOM, not just in the Aries ecosystem, but in a, in a more broad scale, it opened up the conversation to, uh, to carrying the next version of the spec out in, in a different venue. And that's actually how the, the spec working group at the DIFF was created several years ago. Um, and then the output of that effort is actually um, is is actually uh, the DEDCOM spec here. Um, so the relationship is one of origin, uh, but not one of constraint in the sense that um, there were things that uh, that the, that were common in the Aries ecosystem that aren't uh, that don't have to carry over and haven't um, necessarily. But a lot of when you if you Google up DIDCOM, you're going to find a lot of stuff that exists in the Aries ecosystem because that was the origins of it. Um, and so uh, that's that's happening. Um, uh, more continuously as DIDCOM v2 is, is adopted. DIDCOM v2 is, is, is minted just earlier this year uh, in the sense that um, a lot of folks want specs to settle down before they develop on them for sane reasons. Uh, we're all busy and we don't want to develop to a moving target. And so now that it's here, there's been an increased effort of, of adoption. Uh, hat tip to Lance Bird on the, that happens to be on the call here today that's, that's uh, leading that effort within the Ares ecosystem of upgrading all the existing Ares packages to use DIDCOM v2. So DIDCOM v1 will be, uh, you know, the Aries uh, particular flavor of, of that will be gone um, as as uh, as the that migration happens to DIDCOM v2. That's going to be a little bit of an effort uh, for development reasons, but um, uh, you know development schedules and, and needing to provide an upgrade path for existing systems and such. So um, so so yes. Um, so that's that's where the history is. There is some still stuff that, that links there. Um, uh, as we build out things on, on didcom.org, then uh, then the links that link to Aries RFCs are going to eventually go away and they'll point to resources that exist uh, just purely within didcom.org and, and that ecosystem. And so sort of that, that historical dependency will become less and less valuable over time. Uh, hopefully that helped, uh, Rob. And if, if folks want to pipe up and ask a clarifying question or anything, I'm, I'm happy to handle that too. So, uh, Michael asked, number of different transports supported? Um, so the the two that are in the spec uh, right uh, right now are um, HTTP uh, and I say HTTP HTTPS um, and also WebSockets um, and and those are useful for different reasons. Uh, HTTP tends to be the default if you're sending a message and you're not necessarily sending a lot. Um, if you do have or to plan on sending lots of messages back and forth and there's some really obvious use cases for that, um, then WebSockets can be really useful that, for that because of the of the ability to rapidly send messages without you know setting up the transport again. Um, there's a bunch of research being doing into uh, into other transports. Didcom is transport agnostic in the sense that the trust model and the features you get don't depend on the transport, but you obviously have to get it there somehow. Um, and so there have been research done into a lot of areas. One that's progressing pretty fast is um, is uh, libp2p as a transport for Didcom um, that came up. Um, on the call on Monday, um, and and will be progressing, um, and and those can be those can be defined, and then anyone that supports those transports can of course engage on them. There has also been research uh, done into um, into uh, Bluetooth and NFC, uh, and the NFC work uh, more or less concluded, and I'm heavily paraphrasing that. Um, it's useful to bootstrap a connection, kind of like uh, scanning a QR code, but that the actual transport for a more meaningful interaction would be better over something like Bluetooth, simply because the, the proximity details of the two radios matters kind of a lot. Um, it works relatively well in payment because um, you tend to have one message back and forth and that's it. Um, DIDCOM uh, protocols are often a lot more involved, um, and so uh, or they can be. Uh, and so having a connection that doesn't require you to sort of be very careful about your, the placement of your phone is, is useful. Um, I'm skipping over QR codes as well. Um, there is an out-of-band mechanism that can encode a message in, in, into a... Um, uh, into a, a QR code so that you can sort of bootstrap an interaction with a party that you don't know before. So the, the, the base requirements of DIDCOM is that you know the DID of the other party that you're sending a message to and you use that to, to construct the message and transmit it. Um, and so when you don't know the DID of the other party, you have to start from somewhere. And so, uh, and so having uh, one common way, uh, not the only way, but one uh, common way, of course, is to create what we call an out-of-band message that encodes uh, sort of a minimal QR, a minimal DIDCOM message uh, that is not yet encrypted into a QR code so the other party can read it and then, you know, begin and establish a relationship there. 
Um, and so th that's not really kind of a transport, but it kind of falls a little bit into that bucket. So that's the other transports that are that are supported. Um, we we have had um, uh, transports. Uh, investigated an SMTP transport has been created and demonstrated um, mostly to sort of help people understand that you don't have to it doesn't have to use exact web technologies but even something like SMTP could be used um, and then uh, there, the, there's also the potential for offline systems that never have the opportunity to interact over the internet directly to have a sneaker net transport um, that we don't call sneaker net it's more like file based but you could literally walk up with a thumb drive of messages that are all encrypted to the recipient that could then be received on a on a on a you know an offline device or something like that. And so there's a wide variety of those, but the two that are in wide use today are HTTP, HTTPS, and uh, and WebSockets are the are the two there. Uh, how do I get started with Didcom? I wish I had a better answer to this, and I'm working on it. Um, part of what we need is an example of like, hey, here's what you need to use Didcom. The 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 reality today is that most of the didcom code examples are actually um, built inside of the aries ecosystem and they have very specific purposes which is fine if those are your purposes but if they're not then they're, it's not a very good starting example and so i'm working on um, some better starting examples of, of didcom that can help um, understand what's going on my current uh, fun task that meaning the task that i do even though i'm not technically assigned because i really want it to, to exist is that i'm creating um, a Didcom v2 agent that runs on AWS Lambda. And uh, the protocol that I will be implementing primarily is the TrustPing protocol, which is one of the ones defined in, in the spec. Um, and then I'll have an associated client. Uh, I, I say client in the sense that it runs on your computer, but it's the local copy or, or sort of D Didcom uh, software that, that can use to communicate with, uh, with the one that runs in Lambda. So I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. One, that I've always wanted to build a Lambda agent. And so uh, that's one of them. Uh, the other thing is, is that it would be nice to have a code example where you can just pull down some Python with some minimal dependencies that you can install with a package manager and then run it and actually communicate with some other party um, uh, you know, some other existing service that runs over it. And so, and so that's one of the ways the things that I'm doing at the moment to try and help it um, be uh, easier to adopt. Um, at the moment, uh, what you've got is the spec and then the, the beginnings of the, the Didcom book, um, which is very nascent, um, but try to guess the URL and it's not working well. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with a, a URL for the book. That is also um, the, the goal there is to make that a resource um, uh, that is, is a valuable piece of that as well. Um, so yes, the other thing that I'll mention is don't be afraid to invent a new Didcom protocol for your liking. Uh, Didcom protocols have a a protocol URI that can be any HTTP URI. Lots of them reference didcom.org and you're welcome to submit and host the protocol definition there, but you don't have to. It could be an, anything there. Um, the, the goal is that that URI links to documentation that developers can use to figure out what the protocol actually is. And, and those you can just go ahead and, and make them. Um, and so um, and so coming up with, uh, you know, getting started in that manner is good. Um, I would start with Didcom v2 at this point instead of doing the Didcom v1 stuff. Um, and there are Didcom v2 libraries that exist um, that are that are uh, linked from various resources that can help you get started there. That way you're not trying to implement, you know, the encryption wrappers and stuff yourself because that's annoying. Um, we're also under efforts currently to sort of clarify some of the things in those um, in those repositories to make it easier to use. Um, and that way there's, there's sort of better quick start examples and things that can sort of get you past some of the understanding bits a little bit faster. Um, so yes. Okay. Um, assuming uh, Michael says, assuming web seven is built exclusively using did come and did come agents. I, I love the diagram. Um, uh, the, um, it could be, so, uh, web seven is a, it, for clarification is a, uh, is a, a term used by Michael to talk about, um, a white paper that he's written. Um, and, and definitely um, uh, there's the potential for Didcom to be used in, in lots of areas. Um, and I think that that will be helpful. Um, uh, Jay, do we have any developments with the DIDs in regard to self storage, a complete online data profile and the ability to manage data based relationships? So you're asking a good question here, Jay. Um, there's two primary approaches that exist in the in the digital identity space right now. There's a, a communication focused approach and there's a data focused approach. The Venn diagram circles overlap of these two things. 
so an, exa uh, an example of a, of a communication focused approach is of course DIDCOM. Um, uh, an example of a data based approach is something like decentralized web nodes. Um, and they, um, it, they are Turing complete or equivalent in the sense that you're either um, having conversations about data or you're representing your conversations, you know, using data to represent your conversations. Um, and so the, the, there's a lot of overlap there, but I think a lot of opportunities for them to be used together in a really useful way. So one of the things that um, when you can, when you make a connection over DIDCOM, for example, it's common to ask the other party to establish some foundation of trust. Who are you? Like, uh, are you are you my bank? Are you the taco guy? Are you know are you my brother? Like, you know, wh wh who are you in fact? Um, and and generally, the mechanism that has been popular for establishing that trust is exchange, exchanging verifiable credentials. Um, and so, one of the easiest ones that we have uh, talked about in the community, but not executed uh, very thoroughly yet, is the ability to just provide a verified um, a, a proof of, of email. And that's not dissimilar. I mean, the process usually of getting that credential is by, you know, having the issuer send you an email that you click on a magic link, and then they can confirm that you at least have access to the email address. And the useful part about that is that if you can just present a credential, then that happens really fast without anyone having to go click, click a link right then. Um, and so there's some, uh, that's the beginnings of that kind of profile information that you're talking about. Um, it's also entirely possible that what you might provide as a profile is a link to something like a decentralized web node. And so you can say, well, you can talk to me here, but here's some data that you can just access for me. And perhaps the permissions have already been arranged or it's just public um, and, and you can load up information about me there as well. Um, so so there are there are some developments there, um, but not as many as I would like. Um, I think that um, I think that one of the areas that would be really cool for encouraging adoption is to uh, make it easy with any compatible app in the App Store um, to be able to install one of those and interact with websites uh, using standard protocols for, for authentication um, and, and things like that. And, and then the passing of profile information is very similar uh, like that. So the DID itself is, is simply an identifier with a cryptographic key and an endpoint, um, at least as it relates to DIDCOM. And so we're not really going to put that profile information in the DID on purpose. Um, I want to, may want to reserve the right to introduce myself in different ways to different people, et cetera. And so um, there's, there's that option um, to be able to present it in that way. So um, the other thing is that when I say like, you know, there, there's been work here, there hasn't been work there, I have to acknowledge that most of the work here is being driven by companies that are funding development in various areas to make this happen. Um, in, I work for DCO, that's one of the companies that does this. Um, and so the, the natural uh, piece of that is that we build the things we get money to build. And so um, a lot of the cases, uh, I mean, we do a little bit more than that, but but honestly, that's a large driver. Just we, we got to remain in business, right? Um, and so a, a lot of the uh, of the drivers or the initial use cases are starting in our particular case. I know other companies may have different uh, segments, um, but uh, companies that are trying to solve problems with their users. And so a lot of this we're, we're approaching by applying this technology in the relationship between an organization and their customer or an organization and their employee. Um, and so lots of the stuff being developed is, is around that. So for example, uh, employees that want to do employee authentication, um, an employment credential serves the role of a, of a profile uh, piece of information that can be passed back and forth. So that was a little rambly, Jay, but that's a really good angle in question. Um, and and I, that, that was a little fuzzy in the sense that we have st stuff happening, but um, but not as fast as I'd like. Okay. Um, uh, Brent, this is a uh, question using a look at DIDCOM uh, for a secure channel between two agents. One of these agents is an edge hardware device that provides an ephemeral DID key. I've done some work oh, uh, with uh, Mercia on the DID JWT library. JWT looks to be the next step. Uh, open an issue. Awesome. That's cool. Not implemented ECDH between two did keys, so that seems to be another place to understand. Uh, can you implement didcom on top of web sockets? Web sockets, you totally can. Um, what happens is that when you open the web socket connection, it just it, it'll receive the connection on the other side. But until you actually send something, it has no idea who you are. That's the way web sockets work anyway. And so the first message that you send over the web socket is basically the indication to the other party of like who you actually are. Um, and so. Um, the messages are still encrypted and sent as messages uh, all over all the transports to get the security properties that did come allows. Um, but you can totally do it over WebSockets. That's really, really common, in fact, between something like an app running on your mobile uh, phone and, um, and a mediator that allows for message, you know, basically receives messages that can then be relayed to a phone. 
Um, phones, of course, are really bad at hosting HTTP endpoints. Uh, that's not a thing they do, architecturally speaking. And so uh, the mediator can receive that encrypted message, and then and then uh, that can be retrieved by the mobile device to, to get around the, the, the routing there. And it's common for the mobile device to connect with the mediator that they're using over a WebSocket because there's lots of messages back and forth. They might be receiving, you know, if they've been on a plane or something and you get off the plane, turn your phone back on, there might be a batch of waiting messages that can be retrieved all at once over the WebSocket. And so WebSockets are a really efficient way to do that. Totally. Okay. Uh, out of band message needs to be didcom plain text message or uh, can it be a didcom sign message? It can be either. It depends a little bit on what on whether what you're passing um, uh, over the out of band message uh, needs to be integrity protected or not. Um, if you are simply passing a did, then any modification of the did will foul up the whole thing anyway, and so there's not a lot gained by integrity protecting that. If you're passing other information um, in that QR code that is more sensitive, then signing it can be a good idea. Um, and that way, it prevents uh, any sort of tampering uh, from the QR code uh, there generally. Um, so so that, that that's useful. Um, uh, JC asks, where, uh, how and where is DIDCOM currently deployed? Anything bigger in production? What's the current state of DIDCOM in terms of the spec and its implementations? Um, DIDCOM v1 has wide deployment. Um, it's the foundation of the Ares ecosystem, and so all the existing production, um, you know, Ares ecosystems uh, are using DIDCOM v1, which is different than v2, uh, but not substantially. If you know, if if I sort of explain the basics of both of them to you, it would be really easy to see where it came from. Um, I'm proud to say that DIDCOM v2, I believe, is simpler than DIDCOM v1. Um, there's we wrestled with a lot of hard uh, issues and got to the point where uh, the the requirements for DIDCOM v2 are are simpler and we we uh, we um, we solve things in a way that requires sort of less handshaking and setup. Um, in DIDCOM v1, for example, there was a uh, a process. Um, there's two protocols. The old one's called the the connections protocol. The new one's called DidExchange, where you actually sort of engage in a handshake with the other party. And DIDCOM v2 has been constructed so that no handshake is necessary. So if you know the did of another party, uh, let's say because it's like a company and they have it on their website and it's auto-discovered or something like that, then you could just send a message to them directly encrypted the first time without any sort of handshaking or, or any, any precursory type of interaction, which is really cool. Um, so definitely some big stuff in production, um, but um, but that's DIDCOM v1. The Ares ecosystem is just beginning the process sort of by accident of the timeline and when DIDCOM v2 uh, you know, got stamped that, um, that they weren't quite in the state where it was good to work on that as a community yet, but that's, that's, uh, that's coming. Um, and so uh, as far as non Aries implementations, I have less visibility into that because I'm not involved in all the communities. Um, but uh, I hear more and more. I was just at IEW um, you know, a couple weeks ago. And, um, and every time I go, I hear a little bit more about people saying, oh, yeah, and, like I understand what DIDCOM is or I understand why people would use it. I heard this last time several folks say, yes, DIDCOM is on the roadmap for implementing for an identity protocol. And those are folks that haven't been traditionally in the DIDCOM community. So it is expanding. Um, there's not as, as much uh, expansion for non sort of verifiable credential oriented uh, uses. Um, but I'm hoping to sort of help that because I believe it's a technology that applies way beyond um, just just verifiable credentials itself. Amari says, can you can you share a little bit about the Didcom Weekly the user group and the unsync at the diff? I can. So there are two uh, regular Didcom related uh, meetings um, that happen uh, at the diff, um, and those happen on Mondays. Um, and you'll you'll find these on the diff calendar. I highly recommend going to that instead of um, pulling it up uh, and uh, and trying to figure it out yourself. Just because it's the easiest way to get the Zoom link and have it be at the right time. The other thing is is that the world is inconveniently round, so we have time zones and daylight savings time and annoying stuff. And so uh, leaning on the calendar or checking the calendar is the most reliable way to figure out when the meeting actually is. Um, meetings get anchored in the time zone and are subject to the daylight savings time adjustments of that time zone. And if you do it through calendar, then it mostly works out correctly, which um, which is helpful. Um, the spec working group uh, used to week uh, used to to meet every week, um, and um, as the spec was completed, we discovered that most of the topics that folks needed to talk about was actually um, not really of a spec nature, but of a user group nature. And so we had a user group that was uh, that uh, existed in what we called an unsync meeting format um, that happened on the Discord channel. And so uh, this is uh, there's a in, in the um, in the on the diff 
Discord server, there is a DidCom uh, user group, um, uh, open group there uh, that anyone can join uh, without being a member of Diff even. Um, and so uh, you're welcome there to, to join us. Um, and then what happened uh, when we realized that we needed more attention on the user group type topics is that we kept the first Sunday, the first Monday of every month as the spec working group, and then the remaining three Mondays turned into user group meetings. And, and so that way it's a lot easier to talk about things generally that aren't really modifications to the spec, uh, but more just using that. That's convenient because the spec work is very uh, important to have IPR protected for intellectual property rights legal concerns, but the users group doesn't have that same constraint. And so um, this is just folks talking about using it or you know using libraries, uh, you know learning from each other, et cetera. And so that's really useful. Oh, Lance, you posted the did come. Uh, I'm I'm behind in the in the chat, and you posted the did come uh, book link. So I very much appreciate that. Okay, um, so uh, Fabio asks, is there any native JavaScript implementation for ECDH 1PU used by uh, did come to create uh, authenticated uh, encryption and uh, X20P uh, did come for content encryption? I think there is. Hang on a second. So there, are, there's a. Uh, it looks like there is a TypeScript implementation. Oh, hang on. Oh, I see what they did. So they built a Rust library, and then they have compiled it for Wasm. And I'll and I'll drop that link in the chat here. Um, and so that's how they're getting. Oh, I'm not doing this correctly. There we go. Um, so that's how that actually. Um, uh, that's how they're getting to JavaScript. Um, I believe that um, that there's uh, there's more stuff going on here. I'm not a cryptographer, uh, and so my understanding or the or the direct you know the building of the actual encryption libraries is something that I'm not familiar with, which is probably why you also are looking for a library that just does this and has been created by people that understand that stuff really well. Um, so the the library support is growing. Um, we've got uh, the the SIGPA donated a, a number of libraries. Uh, so Rust and Python and um, and a handful of other uh, you know um, implementations that um, that are really useful um, in that area. So the library support is growing, but that's definitely an area of work in front of us to to not just have more libraries and more languages, but actually improve the usability of those libraries themselves. Sometimes we're working along and we're like, wouldn't it be great if there was this? And so there's improvements that you know we can we could submit to those libraries. Um, Jason's great answer. Quick follow-up. After some sort of proof of humanity, I may want to establish a relationship, either a com or node, but I want to uh, control the access to my data based on time. Is there a measure in place to offer an entity an ephemeral data attached to my permanent, like the key I gave expires after one week? This would be useful because of my data is being stored live. The data six months ago isn't me now. If an entity has access to the data, would that be true? So um, we're getting into areas that are relatively outside of DIDCOM. Um, I, I do believe that the decentralized web node concept has the ability to grant permissions, uh, at least for a specific period of time. Um, you could also, from a DIDCOM perspective, re-engage at a protocol at a future time. So, um, you know, if if I connect with you know, company A, and they want some information from me, I can give it to them. If six months later, I, you know, I connect with company B over the protocol and they ask for me for some information, I can give them different information. I could also do that if like it was the same day. I, I, I'm not required to present the same information to both of them. Um, and so, um, and so as far as data access, it depends a little bit on which protocols you're using. Didcom is useful in the fact that you can facilitate um, exchange of information that doesn't necessarily happen over Didcom. For example, did come as a messaging based protocol, it would be a horrible idea to try and implement streaming video over Didcom directly. That's like a really bad application of the technology. But what you could do is facilitate the passing of keys that could then bootstrap a video conversation over a different transport protocol. And then the trust that you have because of the key negotiation that happened over the Didcom channel then translates at least in part to the video conversation that you end up with. And so uh, that's an example. A simpler example of that would be imagine um, the difference between uh, me giving you the phone number that I give everyone, um, and then if you call me on it, I have no idea who you are, versus a DIDCOM protocol that says, I'd like to call you on the phone, and I can respond that says, sure, call this number. And the number that I just gave you may have been one that I like freshly provisioned, 
that hasn't been used in a while or by me or something else, which means that if you call within a couple of minutes, I have a relatively good level of certainty that that's actually you on the phone because it was a phone number I hadn't really handed any, out to anyone else recently. And and then suddenly we are, we're, we're on a phone conversation that doesn't really have cryptographic properties, but because we bootstrap the call from something that does, then you end up with some with some kind of nice transitive trust um, that, that happens there. So um, that's a little bit of a squirrel on your, on your question, but, um, so it depends a little bit on the protocol that you're using to actually transfer the data or allow access to the, the, the data. There's a handful of data storage uh, oriented technologies, um, like in the healthcare space, there's the HIE of one, the health information exchange of one, um, or other types of health access stuff um, that could be facilitated over DIDCOM, or if it's small enough, you could actually just transfer the data over a DIDCOM protocol directly. There's just nothing wrong with that. Um, and so, um, and so hopefully that answer was useful. Um, but uh, yeah, okay, Lamari, thanks for the link to the Discord server. Lance has information on the user group stuff, which is awesome. Um, and also the TypeScript in the work, not by, this is by uh, Blueberry, which is awesome. So very cool. Um, JC, Wallet Connect is a service for connecting crypto wallets to dApps and it would uh, seems it would be easy to use widely deployed. How would you compare Wallet Connect with Didcom? Um, I, uh, the first time I knew about Wallet Connect was when I read it in your message. So I don't know that I can say anything very intelligent about it. Um, the, um, uh, but that's a, that's a good excuse to talk about Didcom's relationship to ledgers. Um, Didcom itself doesn't have anything directly to do with a ledger, except that Didcom requires that dids are in use. And some, but not all, did methods have have a have a reliance on a ledger. So, um, you know, the, if you have one that's based that's bound to Ion, which eventually, uh, you know, is, is a side tree protocol which binds to uh, to, to Bitcoin or um, or to uh, you know some other ledger, then that's how it's in, it's actually involved. The important bit for Didcom is that you is that both parties can resolve the dids of the other parties. Um, so Didcom itself doesn't really take a position about what's used, except that it requires the did method to have a service endpoint present. And that service endpoint is how you tell other people how to get messages to you. Um, that could be the service endpoint that is on a mediator that you've uh, arranged with, or it could be directly to your agent, um, uh, agent simply referring to the software that speaks Didcom. Um, and so um, and so that's how that works. So it, it definitely uh, could be used, but I don't know that I can offer a very useful comparison there. I'm not uh, I'm not very well steeped in sort of the regular crypto uh, you know decentralized application um, area of the of the internet technology that we've got. So I apologize, I'm not as useful there. Um, man, you guys are firing the questions. Um, so Brent, uh, Bob wants to talk to Alice. Um, Bob doesn't know anything other than else other than her did key. Is this uh, possible to accomplish with Didcom by sending a query over WebSockets as a perfect previous answer? This would be awesome. So did key doesn't allow you to specify an endpoint. And so alone itself, just by itself, it doesn't actually work for Didcom unless you're happening to pass the did key in some sort of a discovery message uh, that can also contain the endpoint. Um, I would point you to the peer did method, which is like the did key method, only it allows you to encode service endpoint information and actually multiple keys if you need within the did. It does make the did a little bit lengthy um, compared to some, some others, but, but does provide you the ability to simply represent something like a key in an endpoint without having to register anything on a ledger at all. In fact, the Aries ecosystem primarily uses peer dids when they're communicating, certainly with software that's related to people, um, simply because you can create them quick by doing some math and then share them with just another party. Um, and then that other party knows you're dead and they can communicate with you. So that's a, actually a really good privacy, privacy respecting way to make that, but also means that you don't need to like register it on a ledger or anything else um, for just a regular participant. So so I Brent, I'd, I'd point you to, to also, in the did the peer did method, there's three actually like encodings of that. There's zero, one, and two. Zero is equivalent to did key. Two is the is the did key plus endpoint encoding stuff. And then uh, method one is a lot more complicated, but it actually allows you to update um, in in rotate keys and things like that in ways that um, that you can't do with the other stuff. Speaking of rotation, didcom has the ability in a message to rotate the did that you're using for a relationship. So if you happen to be using one did and you want to use a different did for the relationship, you can 
pass a provenance proof inside of didcom messages that helps the other party recognize the new did as being related to the old did and proof that you've authorized that rotation. Um, and that isn't just one did and another did in the same method that can be used to rotate between any didcom capable dids um, uh, with any did method. And so if you're, you're on like a peer, you know, a did peer and you want to move to like an Ethereum based one, you can do that or, or vice versa or whatever. Um, that's commonly used when there's a peer did created and stuck in an invitation in a, in a, in a QR code that may be posted somewhere. Um, and, and, and really quickly, um, the, they, the party will often rotate away from the did that was in the QR code to a fresh one um, for privacy reasons. And so that's that's common, uh, but you can actually do that at other times for other reasons as well. What tools do you recommend for debug debugging didcom? Uh, for example, if we uh, all keys of, of everyone involved in the communication, is their proxy able to log all the messages in plain text? So there, there kind of isn't right now. One, there, there have been discussions in the community about ways to have tracing servers or other things to, to be involved. Um, the, there's a challenge here between making it sane for developers to understand this stuff and uh, and making it hard for developers to do the wrong thing. And so having a like a escape hatch mode that you can trigger on that like suddenly like takes apart the encryption makes it really hard um, to, to do and make that work. But there's definitely some logging and some other sorts of uh, testing that can be done from a developer perspective, perspective to make that work. Um, so um, the, there is definitely, uh, Fabio, work to be done there um, to, to make that easier. Um, there, are, there is some tooling that has been used in the DidCom v1 community that has not been updated to DidCom v2. Um, uh, and, and would need to talk as a community about whether we think that would be useful or not. There's an there's an Aries toolbox that that, that does some sort of native uh, didcom uh, v1 style debugging stuff um, as as a client. It, it, it's kind of like a Postman, and that like you can actually just like type in a message and hit go to send to the other party without having to like write code to do so. Um, and so I suspect that the emergence of tools like that will be useful. The other thing that I think is is useful, and this is one of the reasons I'm building a trust ping agent that's just will be run public perpetually as a as a public service of SAM is that um, is that I it would be easy it would be, it's nice to know that your code can talk to other code and actually it's working the way that you expect and so and so having some more services online that that speak some of these protocols is is another sort of foundation step that can help with that um, and uh, one of the things I've thought about there because there's there's like nothing that can be really tr be transferred of a personal nature in a trust ping is I could actually have an associated page that spit out any errors that happened recently when talking to the trust ping service. And what that would do would let you, if an error occurred, you could actually go see some detailed error information um, that happened on that page just for that service. I wouldn't normally do that for an agent, but from a debugging perspective, having a service that's willing to sort of provide some of that debug information is useful. Um, I haven't done it yet, but that's that's on my to-do list. Uh, so, uh, Wall Connect is uh, a Stun service. Uh, Stun is a way to get around firewalls uh, natively. Um, uh, that would be interesting. I, I yeah, I don't know much about it. Oh, and Lamari's got a new Discord link if the other one doesn't work. Yeah, we're at the Ooh. top of the hour. Do you want to keep going, Sam? A few more um, minutes? Or? If folks had a question, I'd be happy to answer one. But also, I've been talking for a minute, so I'm going to take a drink of water. <laughs> but great questions. I'm I'm thoroughly happy with the questions that folks have been asking. It's been great. Yeah, it's really great. Um, yeah. Um, so if you want to keep going, we can go a little longer. Um, and just just let us know when you're when you're out of time. Okay. Yeah, I do have a, a, a break before my next scheduled meeting, which is good. Um, so uh, Fabius, is there a protocol to generate a random number between parties or anyone working on one? Uh, not that I know of, um, but uh, that would be a great thing to have in the community, um, particularly if, if, if it's a random number for a purpose that's communicated semantically, right? Like here's why we're doing this. Or um, the other thing that could happen, um, this hasn't been done either, but um, it would be possible, for example, to do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange um, over the existing connection. Um, I, I realize that's usually done in a place where you don't already have security and Didcom gives you that, but that might be a useful feature in the bootstrapping of other protocols. Um, and so that, that kind of a thing could be useful as well. Um, so yeah, cool. I, I hope my answer has been good um, and, and helpful. Any, any, any other questions? Let's play stump the Sam. I, I guess you did. I didn't know anything about wall connect, so I couldn't say anything useful. So you stumped me. That's...
Does anybody have any last questions for Sam? Nope. Okay. Looks like uh, looks like we're good. Um, Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah, that was really fun. And um, you know, maybe as DidCon progresses more, we can do this again down the line and um, get some more people on, and hopefully get the Zoom link to work in Eventbrite. But um, but yeah, it was great. <laughs> oh, what would I like to see happen with DidCom next year? Um, I would like enough community resources. I have a couple things, but but one of my pet project things is that I really like speaking at things like open source conferences. And when you go to an open source conference, they're not identity people. And so they need to understand the benefits of DidCom and they need to know, understand how to get started. I could talk about the benefits, but we don't yet have a really stupid, simple example of write this code in a simple web server and go download this app and now you can do this thing. And that I think would be amazing. And so I, I want to be able to give a presentation that says, hey, here's how you can use some of these identity concepts brewed up in the identity communities, but use them in whatever system you happen to be using. And like, here's, a, here's an example in like 15 lines of code, right? That's, that's what I'm working on. Um, and, and I think that that would be really powerful. So I'd love to see that happen. Um, the other thing that I'd love to see happen is I'd love to see, and, and I'm, I'm pretty confident this will happen, but I'm still excited about it. Um, I am, um, I'm really excited to, to see the Aries community adopt DidCom V2 um, and because it's going to open up a lot of, of sort of compatibility windows uh, with other folks that are building stuff. Um, and so I see this uh, this next year being the year where, where DidCom takes hold and becomes dominant in the particularly the Aries ecosystem, but also I think it's going to become a lot more common in some of these other interactions as we have them. Um, one of the things that um, is convenient with DidCom is that it provides you some batteries included like authentication and, and, and you know, how to designate a protocol and some other things. And so I, um, um, I'm always delighted when I see things that use DidCom that I didn't know about, like they had someone else did them without me knowing that that gets me really excited. And, um, and I'm looking forward to the development of a lot more protocols for specific purposes that people want to build and and some of they may share with the broader broader community some they may not both are okay um but but i'm really excited to see the the growth of that as well um and it it, it solves a handful of really useful problems that um that i i think could be really useful so i, I see uh i hope it becomes a foundation for a lot of the stuff that we build in a way that helps that progress faster and then have some some sort of really nice out of the box abilities so, ah, right, JC, good questions. Regarding the symbol, uh, symbol do thing, and you'll see why it's good. The whole SSI ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, I, I will, I will hand that to you. And I believe that's coming. Um, the, the people have asked me like, why hasn't that happened yet? And, and I, I don't have a crystal ball, but um, I suspect it's because, um, we, in order to deploy, in order to uh, make money as a company developing this technology, you've got to have like a whole ecosystem. You have to have issuers, holders, and verifiers, speaking of verifiable credentials, in an ecosystem that, that works together and like, it's got to be a whole package, right? You can't just have an ecosystem of issuers like that's not useful or just holders or just verifiers. And so, um, I, uh, so what's happened is, is that the companies building this technology are selling to people that can pay at least for an entire ecosystem, even if it's a really small one, but the whole thing together. And so I, I see this also maturing within the next year to the point where um, there'll be really easy examples where you can just like pull some Docker containers and hit, hit go and suddenly have a, have a system up and running. But in addition to that, I would love existing services online that can facilitate some basic interactions by default, so that the, you could the, the, your minimum interaction is not running Docker containers, but rather just installing an app on your phone and then connecting to and interacting with several online services that do things like a service that verifies your email address um, and presents you a credential of that, for example, um, and other services that will let you log in with your with a presented email address. Um, and so that that uh, itself would be a really useful um, a, a really useful demonstrator of like do this thing and it works with but in the VC ecosystem. So totally. Um, we should do DHH to do an SSI tutorial. Uh, I think that would be good. Uh, part of me hopes we're slightly more mature when he arrives so that he doesn't have uh, characteristic DHH things to say about our ecosystem. <laughs> so it, there's always something more to do, of course, but, uh, but I'm, you know, trying to, trying to make it good at the, at the pace we can. Cool. Great questions. 
A WhatsApp signal replacement. Uh, I think Didcom actually makes a really compelling case for that, but I've, I've been reluctant to talk about it super broadly because I don't want people to get lost in the full capabilities of what Didcom can do uh, if they see it first as simply a human chat replacement. Uh, I, I think that they would do an excellent job at that. Um, Didcom right now um, is, is primarily, is just one did to another did, which means that natively it doesn't have anything like group support. There's been conversations about how to add group support and support that on top of what we're doing. Um, and those are good conversations. And I suspect, not that we're begun to work on this at all, but I suspect that group stuff will be actually uh, a primary focus of the next version of, of Didcom when, when that begins. And again, there's no announcements. The work has not begun and is not slated to begin for a bit. So, um, so yes, I, I do, part of the problem, um, people look at DIDs and like, why do you need DIDs? And, and there's, there's uh, really good reasons, um, but um, you have to have an application that actually makes sense before this technology makes sense to like normal people, to like my mother, right? And so uh, being able to see that together, um, I think is really helpful. The did come working conversations. So the, the, um, the spec conversations are on Slack the user group conversations are on Discord. And I suspect that Discord is gonna be by and large the majority of the conversation going forward um, this next year, simply because the actual spec related issues are relatively few in number. And most of it's about applying the tech, not developing it. Yeah. So so yes, I, I think chat could really work. One of the cool things that Didcom can do really well, by the way, is interleave protocols. So if you have a protocol that you're using, like there's a basic message protocol right now um, that is think like SMS without anything else. Um, so you can send basic messages uh, back and forth between two parties, but you could also then suddenly throw in like a credential request and you can interleave protocols in really useful ways. And so um, it's not a, it's not about, well, first I want to have a chat app and now I need to add the ability to do credential exchange in it. Well, if Didcom already has the ability to do credential exchange, then you can just interleave the protocol directly without having to like support it in the chat portion of the protocol. And so that's the neat part is that you can combine various protocols in really useful ways. Um, here's another example. Um, I imagine uh, this is not built yet, but I want it to exist. I share my location with my family. Um, it's really useful and it's kind of convenient. I've got a brother that lives here in town. And so um, it's convenient when I, I see he's at Costco or something, or if I know he's home because I need to go borrow a tool or something. And so, um, uh, and right now, the, really the only way to sanely do that is using o, like vendor OS provided stuff. You can use, you know, um, you know, Apple can do it in their ecosystem. Uh, Google Maps will, will also do it. But I'd love a protocol that is used for sharing location. And uh, that the location sharing protocol could be used to share location like a lot, like, a, like on a regular basis, or it could be used just within the context of a chat. So I could uh, you know, be talking along and then I could hit a button that sends my location right then to the other party, not as a regular subscription, but just as a one-time thing. And that'd be super convenient if you're like meeting someone at a work conference and you're trying to tell them what restaurant you're at. Um, and, and to be able to do that would be really useful. And so you have a protocol that can be used in two contexts. One is, is the, within the context of, of, of an application. The other one is, is sort of regular automated processing of, of, of location sharing. And, and both are really useful. Um, and, uh, and, and so being able to interleave them like that, I think is one of the really cool features that Didcom has. And, and you don't need to do anything special to do that. Like it's just sort of built in because of how protocols work on top of Didcom. So really cool. Nice. Anything else? I'm 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 uh, I'm spewing words at a furious rate here. Okay. I, I may have exhausted the audience, Lamari. <laughs> we finally reached the end. Yeah, amazing. You're all, you're Thanks, all welcome. Sam. This is very fun. <laughs> Thank you, Lamari. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and thank you, Sam, for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for your patience with all the, you know, stuff in the beginning. But it was a great discussion and we're going to get it out. Um, you know, I'm going to get it out with the um, hopefully maybe we can do a transcript, too. But um, yeah, I'll get that out far and wide for the community. So sounds great. Thanks. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sam. <laughs>